You're watching Capital Connection from the Illinois State Capitol. Joining us now is House Democrat Chris Welch. It's good to have you with us. Oh, thank you for having me. I want to get your reaction first to the biggest news of the week here with former Governor Blagojevich. Uh, he compared himself in his sort of uh, homecoming tour uh, to, he compared his court case to that of Dred Scott. He quoted Martin Luther King. He called himself a political prisoner whose freedom was, quote, stolen from him and compared himself to immigrants who fled oppression under a Nazi regime. Is this man seeing clearly? Well, he clearly hasn't changed. Uh, I mean, he, he's Blagojevich. Uh, that's how he was before he went in, and that's how he is now. Uh, and I, I would say if there's anything to sum up the week, it's unfortunate to see that there's no contrition, uh, that he didn't learn anything. Uh, you would think that uh, after getting out, whether you agree or disagree with what President Trump did, that he would be remorseful. Uh, and I'm, I'm sad to see that he's not remorseful. That's often the sort of parable of, of the test of, of a king or a president letting someone out of prison or their cell is have they shown remorse Correct. for their actions? Have they confessed and copped to what, what they did? And, and often that's the first barrier. And it seems that in this case, I think Mayor Lightfoot even said uh, that, uh, or, uh, pardon me, it was Senate President Harmon who made the point that uh, President Trump doesn't like to apologize for things he did wrong. And now in this case, he's rewarding people who, like him, don't apologize for things they've done wrong. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how similar they are. Uh, you know, they they're, they're truly are birds of a feather. Uh, I personally would have liked to seen the former governor come out and be a little bit more contrite, uh, apologetic to the citizens of the state of Illinois. Uh, because I got to tell you, I was one of the people who believed the sentence was too long. Uh, he's a convict. He's going to always be a convict. He's a felon. He's going to always be a felon, uh, and deservedly so that he can't run for office in the state of Illinois ever again. But I did think his sentence was too long. And then when I see him hold a press conference and not be contrite and apologetic at all, um, you know, it, it makes a lot of people believe he should go right back in there. It's interesting to see. And I think a lot of uh, reasonable people have said 14 years comparatively to other similar crimes like George Ryan, uh, it just didn't quite match up. But you, you do have that contrition angle as well. Um, if we re rewind the clock back to when Governor Blagojevich was very popular and in Chicago, he did have a wide swath of support from the black voter base. And, and how do you explain that? How was he able to tap into that kind of support uh, back then? Well, Rob Bogoyevich is extremely popular still to this day in the black community. He's like a rock star in districts like mine. Uh, and that's because he did things that uh, appealed to black voters. Uh, you know, he provided health care for kids. He provided things for seniors like free rides. Uh, he appealed to the most vulnerable. Uh, and uh, in many aspects, those are folks in the black community. Uh, and so uh, he, he was then and he is now still a very popular person uh, in African-American circles. And yet we heard those FBI wiretap tapes where he would discuss the black voter base as something to be taken uh, granted. Uh, he, he would take it for granted or he would discuss it in sort of a unvarnished political calculation terms, even with uh, now Governor Pritzker, those many years ago, and they were talking about how to, uh, maybe we should put Jesse White in President Obama's Senate seat, or uh, when you hear a politician like that discuss the black voter base in those terms and sort of take them for granted, that can't sit well. You know, it, it shouldn't sit well. Uh, and if, if you really pay attention, I, I heard Blagojevich describe himself this week as a, a Trumplecrat. Those two guys are extremely similar. He was actually Donald Trump in politics before we ever realized Donald Trump will become a politician. In what way? Uh, he loves to play to the TV. Uh, he loves being in the media and talking things up. And unfortunately, a lot of times people, that's all they see is they see the celebrity side and they don't really uh, delve any deeper uh, and, and see uh, what their true beliefs are. Those tapes were played everywhere. But the reality is, is a lot of people probably still to this day never heard them. It's interesting. Uh, you've also, uh, in recent uh, months and in the last year or so pushed uh, for more uh, diversity in corporate boardrooms. I think that was a big uh, push of yours. Uh, Governor Pritzker responded to that and said, let's study the issue a little while longer before we act on it as a state. Yeah. Uh, how does that bill work? How, what, what is it that you're aiming to achieve there? Clearly, we're trying to put more uh, people of color at the board table. Uh, a lot of these businesses are making a lot of money uh, off of uh, minorities uh, in terms of dollars and cents. But when you actually study it, if you actually put people of color around the table, have diversity around the table, they'll actually make even more money because diversity propels performance. 
Uh, and we know that by looking at the data that we were able to compile last year, uh, that these big Fortune 500, 100 companies aren't as diverse as they should be. Yeah, and what does it look like right now? Uh, are uh, largely, being left white, out? largely white male, uh, uh, but you know, there, there's been a movement afoot uh, and there's been some uh, dramatic improvement, uh, but I think there's a lot more room to go. Uh, and we want to see men, we want to see women, we want to see blacks, we want to see Latinos, we want to see Asians, uh, everyone represented on corporate boards. Uh, and the data clearly shows that diversity propels performance. So I believe next year when this is in full effect, uh, March of 2021, when the report cards come out, a lot of companies are, are positioning to try to make sure they look good. Uh, so I think we're going to make a, a, a dramatic impact in how corporate boards look. Very interesting. Uh, so uh, can I presume that you hope to pick up the bill again to, to bring this mandate to acquire corporate boardrooms to have a certain uh, diversity uh, benchmark? Well, you know, Governor uh, Pritzker made some changes to the bill that I filed, and I actually think he made it a better bill, Mark. Uh, I got to tell you that, you know, I think this is going to be a national model because this corporate report card is going to either publicly pat someone on the back or publicly shame them. Uh, and I think no uh, business wants to be publicly shamed. Sunlight is the best disinfectant in that case. Boom. Very interesting. All right, well, there was other big news this week. Governor Pritzker gave his second annual budget address. There were sort of two budgets in here. One, if he gets his progressive income tax. One, if he does not. That's right. Let's focus on that second part, the one where if voters reject it, like they've done three times now in Colorado, the most recent state to put that question to the voters. If voters in Illinois do what they did in Colorado and say, nope, we're not quite ready for the progressive income tax just yet, Governor Pritzker has said, well, there goes the education funding formula. We're not going to give it that full $350 million increase. We're going to shave that about in half, reducing it by $150 million. Is that fair to kids in underfunded school districts? Well, I, I, I think all of us have to be concerned about the uh, equity-based uh, school funding formula that we work so hard to put in place. Uh, however, the governor uh, is in a unique position. Uh, you know, pension obligations continue to rise and other pressures on the budget continue to rise. Uh, and so he had to uh, come in yesterday uh, or this week and present uh, uh, various scenarios. Uh, and he basically was giving us, here's what I would hope for, uh, but if my hopes don't pan out, here's what's really going to happen. Uh, and I think we, he had to do that. It's sort of a pickle, though, because now the budget office has said, hey, here's $1.4 billion of spending we'd like to do, but we can't do it without the progressive income tax. And now some Republicans are sort of eyeing that chart, that spreadsheet, and saying, oh, maybe, maybe that's discretionary spending anyways, and we don't have to do it either way, with or without the progressive income tax. And so they've, all these chips are now on the table when it comes to the budget-making process. What kind of a predicament does that create? Uh, well, I mean, as Democrats want to sort of still lift up their priorities, but they've sort of exposed some, some spending that Dem Republicans are saying, look, we don't have to spend all that there. I think people are going to play politics with the issue uh, no matter what uh, you do. Uh, the governor clearly wasn't a pickle, as you just said. Uh, but the reality is, is that those are core areas that people really care about. Uh, and if you want to see those areas uh, uh, at their best, here's scenario A. Uh, if you uh, are really concerned uh, and want the progress to continue, here's what can possibly happen in scenario B uh, if scenario A doesn't happen. I, he just had to present both of those scenarios in a realistic way. Uh, and the, you know, the other party is going to say what they have to say. Very interesting. All right, so uh, we're, we're, we're now staring down the barrel of the start of... Uh, Basically, uh, spring training is upon us here. There's a baseball season in full swing. March Madness just around the corner. Maybe sports betting will be up and running. Governor Pritzker says in his budget address it should be here by the start of March Madness. Uh, all this college sports and, and really sports in general has uh, people excited, sports fans alike. Yeah. Uh, maybe our audience, uh, some in our audience may not know you played college baseball for Northwestern. I did. An Illini, or uh, Not an Illini alum, but an Illinois uh, yeah. college athlete alum there. Uh, you've got a very interesting push. It's gotten some national headlines even to... Uh, push like they've done in California, here in Illinois, to allow college athletes to be paid. I, I want to break that down a little bit because I think you've got a few different ways they can do that through endorsements, through merchandise sales, through the university directly even. Uh, how, how is it, or why, it, let, let's start with the how, and we'll get to the why in a minute, but how is it that you think college athletes should be paid? What's the best way to, to do that in a, in a fair way? So the bill I have pending is not a pay-to-play uh, uh, bill. 
Uh, that's a different issue, and I think it would uh, take a lot more work uh, and uh, significant push Paying to get it done. Paying them like you pay the pros. Correct. You, you know, it wouldn't, schools wouldn't be required to pay any type of salary or anything. What we're saying here is, is that colleges, universities, coaches, all of these folks are making millions and billions of dollars off of the name, likeness, and image of an athlete. So why shouldn't the athlete be able to also benefit from their own name, likeness, and image? They should be able to go out and sign endorsement deals. They should be able to go out and promote local businesses in these college towns. Nowadays with social media, all of them have social media accounts. They should be allowed to get paid to promote things on their social media. Uh, if they do it now, they will lose their eligibility to play in, under NCAA rules. And that's why there's this national movement all across the country, state by state. Uh, people are putting pressure on the NCAA uh, and Illinois should, should, should join that fight. And that's why I've been pushing really hard. And I think the governor has given his support to, to that idea. Uh, the governor's uh, very supportive of it. Uh, he's come out very publicly in support of this. The House, in a strong bipartisan way, has uh, voted for the bill. And now we just need the Senate to act. So that's the how. You, you want the Senate to take action on this. You, you, you want to see this happen through endorsement deals or through uh, selling their name, image, or likeness. Uh, we've seen some college athletes push the envelope on that a little bit. Um, but. But I guess the question here, and maybe this is an obvious one, but, but why do this, especially when some of the, uh, the old gray beards of the NCAA will, will, will tell you, we've got a way of doing things here. Tradition says otherwise, and uh, we want to keep these student athletes first. Uh, and, and, and this is the argument that you see, and we have saw some of that from, I think, uh, one of your colleagues, House Democrat Anthony DeLuca, on the floor last year. Uh, saying that this would corrupt the game of, of college sports if we were to go down this road. What's the argument uh, against that? Well, I, for me, it's all about equity and fairness. Uh, this is about equity and fairness. If you don't think big money's involved in college sports already, you're being naive. In a couple of weeks, March Madness is going to kick off, and in just a three-week period of time, the NCAA is going to profit at least a billion dollars, at least, and not a dime of that is going to go into the uh, pockets of students. Uh, and so the NCAA is making money, the colleges and universities are making money, the coaches, they can go out and uh, whoever wins the tournament is going to be able to give speeches for ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a speech. Why shouldn't the student be allowed to do the same thing? We're not saying take anything away from the colleges, universities, or the NCAA. So that's the students partake in it as well. Yeah, it's interesting though because what about the D2 tennis athlete who's you know working just as hard but maybe just doesn't have the exposure or someone who's on the rowing team or so, some other sort of maybe lesser known sport uh, they wouldn't really have access to that same uh, profit uh, pool out there would they? Well you, you'd be surprised because I've been talking to experts in this all across the country and what's going to end up happening whether it's division one two or three whether you're a, a, a softball player or a golfer, they're gonna market whole teams, they're gonna try to sign up whole, whole teams, they're gonna make money on social media, they're gonna make money promoting local businesses, and because they're promoting these local businesses, you're gonna lift up economies in all these college towns all across the state. Uh, I don't see a negative at all. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't know many people, in, in, in public opinion certainly supports the idea that college athletes for their work are employees and should be and could be paid. Uh, but you have the question here of how to do it and whether or not the university does it outright yeah. or whether or not you let basically outside third party advertisers come in and do this. I wonder about the purity of, of all that. Does introducing advertising to the college mix, does that change the culture of the game, the purity of the game, or the, the, the sort of insularity of the locker room in some way where now instead of saying hey this is about the name on the on the front not the name on the back does that change sort of the purity dynamic of the college sport at all I think that's a great question and you know advertising is already part of the big business of college sports uh, the, the reality is is that the athletes don't benefit from those those advertisements right now just the colleges and the universities and the NCAA I guess, well, but would you be open to an alternative route where the college says, okay, we've, we've raised this money through advertising and we're making it available to all of you on an individual basis, I guess? I, I'd love to look at something like that, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, any, anything that would, would bring more equity and fairness to the athlete, I'm, I'm all ears. 
All right, let's talk about a little internal House politics uh, briefly because we just saw some news this week again. The Sun-Times just reported uh, that House Speaker Michael Madigan has been named in yet another uh, subpoena, a search warrant from the IRS at uh, local government in the Chicago suburbs. Uh, this is not the first time the Speaker or some of his allies have come under the microscope of the federal government. We don't yet want to leap to conclusions. We don't know what they're looking for. Um, but we see the tally of Speaker Madigan's legal bills, and they are long. He's spending a lot of money uh, right now uh, to his lawyers as he mounts some sort of uh, what we can presume to be a defense. Uh, but uh, again, no charges have yet been filed. How does that affect House Democrats and their ability to do their job, knowing that the Speaker right now is under some sort of investigative probe as wide as it may be? What does that do to House Democrats as you guys try to advance your political uh, agenda in Springfield? Well, I, I got to tell you, the spirit in Springfield this session so far has been great. Uh, you know, a lot of us have already had uh, regular meetings and dinners with the speaker, uh, and he's in good spirits. Uh, and uh, as far as we know, he's cooperating with whatever investigations that are happening. Uh, I'm not aware of anything that says that he's the target of any investigation. Uh, but I got to tell you, you know, so far session's been great. We're looking forward to a great uh, rest of the year. Uh, and you know, Speaker Madigan is our speaker. Uh, indeed, he is, uh, and and yet these. Uh, so, so you don't see that there's any, you think he can handle both jobs at once. Uh, Senate President Harmon recently made the case that he's stepping down from his law firm because to be a legislative leader requires his full focus. Does Speaker Madigan just have more focus available to him in his reserves where he can do two things at once, three things at once? I think that was more of a, just a personal choice of Senator, Senate President Harmon. Uh, I will tell you, we are a citizen legislature. Uh, the beauty of our legislature is that we have doctors, lawyers, mm -hmm. teachers, farmers, people who have other jobs uh, outside of here serving in our legislature. If everyone quit their, their job uh, to serve in the legislature, I honestly don't think you would have uh, certain types of people serving. I think it would become a, a place where you only get the wealthy uh, serving in the legislature. I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing law for 23 years. I can't afford to quit my law firm. Uh, and just stay in the legislature. But I think Senator Harmon made the case about legislative leaders specifically, just the four tops who, who have that outsized power, more so than uh, uh, individual legislator, um, and, and, and bigger work duties as well. But we can, we can move on. One last inside baseball question, I think, which was, was, you're, you're now uh, leading a committee, I think, uh, yes. which, which looks at uh, the appointment of House Democrat Luis Arroyo's replacement. Is that correct? Yes. And, and so how do you judge? There, a lot of Democrats, Governor Pritzker included, said that Luis Arroyo, as a local politician uh, or, who or still has power and clout and friends and connections, should not have any role in, re in replacing himself, in, in appointing his replacement. How do you view that issue as, as local politics is all there? From, from Springfield, what's your role in sort of playing? Is it referee here? Or how, do you, how do you oversee this? You know, as chair of this special committee, uh, I see my job as to be the impartial referee, uh, you know, to let the facts fall where they may and follow those facts. Uh, we're going to convene, uh, we're going to set rules, uh, and we're going to hear the, the folks who have made the complaints. We're going to also hear from uh, Representative Delgado. Uh, she's entitled to due process, uh, uh, and she's going to be given due process. And we're going to make sure politics is, is nowhere involved in this process whatsoever. So is it uh, the job of your committee then to investigate whether or not or the extent to which how, uh, Luis Arroyo was involved? Well, it's the job of this committee uh, to make sure that uh, Representative Delgado is given due process uh, and that the rules have been, have been followed, House rules, the Illinois Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, uh, make sure those things have been followed, uh, and we're going we're gonna to adhere to that. What do you make of, and I guess I'll leave you with this, but what do you make of the overall appointment process? I think uh, there was a recent report that Illinois is one of only four states that allows this sort of um, medieval almost a replacement process where if one sitting le legislator leaves for whatever reason, it's a, a, a small huddle of a few local politicians who pick, who right. hand pick that replacement. Is that a democratic approach? It's one way. I mean, it's one valid way of doing things. There's other ways that states do it. Uh, I've seen the articles about uh, governors uh, picking the person. That's still political. We actually had a governor go to jail, just got out uh, after serving eight years because he was trying to sell the replacement. Politics is going to always be involved in these things. It's our job to put people with integrity uh, in these positions, 
uh, so that whatever the process is, uh, when these things come up, you can trust them and that the rules that are set out are followed. All right, fascinating discussion with House Democrat Chris Wells. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, always. And uh, a lot of we'll, we'll keep uh, covering all these stories as they progress throughout Springfield this year. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. We're back in a moment.